This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Uh, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine Gray Mullen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call board members as you hear your name called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on hold. Michael Burt Whistle. I'm here. Maria Chow. Here. Jack Jemsick. Here. David Levenstein. Here. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let IT or Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raised hand function to ask a question or make a comment. You, I will see the raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, please remember to remute uh, re yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the uh, one of the public comment periods, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide. It will be yeah. on the agenda um, and can be entered into the search engine by typing HTTPS colon backslash backslash amersmass.zoom.us backslash J backslash nine five one six two one seven three three two nine. The link can also be found uh, on two different places on the town one uh, website. One way is through the calendar listing for this meeting from the home page and then find the link with the event details. A second way is to go to the planning board web page and click on the most recent agenda link. On the agenda, there is a link towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Included on tonight's agenda, item three, is the joint public hearing with the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, or known as CRC. The board and the CRC will discuss uh, and hear public comment regarding the proposed zoning bylaw article 14. Temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath. This item is expected to begin at approximately 645. Uh, moving onward, the slide will now show the meeting agenda. Again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link at the top. Uh, so item one, minutes. We, I believe we have no minutes for tonight, so we're going to skip over that. Item two is the public comment period. And this is um, a time the public can comment on something that is not on our agenda and that we'll be talking about um, tonight where they'll have a chance to speak later. Um, so Pam, uh, do you yeah. see any... I'm clicking away here. Uh, is there any um, attendees that would like to speak at this time? Um, I see no, I see no I raised hands. I don't and, see any raised hands. And no telephone? And no telephone numbers. Okay. Nope. 
So tonight is planning board chair. I am taking the liberty to move to item uh, six, form A, A and R subdivision applications. Attorney Tom Reedy is here tonight to answer questions regarding A and R 2020-18 for, uh, for a property on the east side of Sunderland Road. Um, welcome, Mr. Reedy. Um, can we have, and uh, Ms. Bestroff, is there any, um, would you, I know this is a carryover from our last meeting. Um, I think it would be a good idea if Mr. Reedy presented um, this a &R. It's a little bit um, complicated, slightly complicated. So okay. he would be best to present it. We have uh, some, some stuff was in our packet and there's some additional um, slides, maps that will be shown. Uh, welcome, Mr. Reedy, are you there? I'm here. Ah, and there you are. Thank you <laughs> for joining us. Hey, everybody. Good to see everyone. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of Sunderland Road North. Um, and so what we're dealing with, Pam, if you want to maybe skip down to the next, why don't you go to the next slide before the aerial? This one? Sure, that's fine. Um, and maybe actually that's good. So just to orient everyone, the yellow highlighted piece of land is the subject parcel that we've got a smaller parcel coming out of. Um, it's about a 40 acre piece altogether and it abuts the Podic substation. And so if you want to go to the next aerial, Pam, there you go. So that's the substation, uh, Western Mass Electric Eversource owns it. They own that one and the one immediately to the north of it. Their substation um, exists on that land. It's entirely fenced in. You'll see that there's a, some green lines towards the upper right corner of that um, aerial. That's a, those, those are the, that's a transmission easement. They have transmission wires that go from that substation out. Um, and they wanna, be, they wanna do some work on those transmission wires. However, their only access right now is through the substation. The substation is fenced under, I believe it's federal law. Everybody that enters into that fenced in area needs to go through security protocols because it is a substation for electricity generation, which I think after 2001 had a little bit more scrutiny associated with it. So in order to avoid that, they approached the landowners of that southerly parcel and said, essentially, hey, can we have that small piece? And if Pam, you wanna go back to the a &R, maybe one more oh. above that, uh, right fine. there. So they asked for the piece that is outlined. It's a 0 0.620 acre portion of that larger 40 acre uh, parcel. And the request is really just to endorse this plan to allow this conveyance to happen so that Eversource can actually do their transmission work. And if you go back to the aerial, Pam, you'll see that those swamp mats are about where that, in, that, that neck of the ANR plan is, is going to be. And then it just goes back into that open area. So, you know, there's no new curb cuts on 116. They're going to be accessing off of 116 through their existing roadway, but just before they get to that fenced in substation, they'll head down onto their property where those swamp mats are um, to actually perform the transmission upgrades. So that's that's it in a nutshell. I'm obviously happy to answer any questions that, that you have. Thank you. Are there uh, any questions from the board? And I see, I see I'm going to call on Miss Bestrup first, and then I see Doug Marshall. I just wanted to translate um, what Mr. Reedy said. He was talking about swamp mats, and those are the grayish things that are lined up there. When I first heard him say that, I thought some, he was saying something different. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Those are mats that are laid down so people can drive heavy equipment over um, wetland areas. Uh, um, I removed my name, my hand I, because she answered my question. Perfect. Uh, Great job, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Um, are there any other board questions to this? I am not seeing any hands. So at this time, I'll ask the board, raise your hand if any of you have an issue with the chair signing this ANR. 
And Chris, I'm seeing no hands, so I believe um, this is good to go. And you and I can later set up a time for me to come in and sign them. Good, thank you. Mr. Eady, thank you. Thank Short you but sweet. Much. Have a great night, everybody. Stay well. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Chris, uh, Chris, Chris yeah. and Christine, mm -hmm. uh, can you see me? Yes. You can, because uh, right. I, I'm having some difficulty here. I think I'm gonna leave the meeting for a moment and I'm gonna come back in if I can. Are you the only host? Can you make me a co-host? I was trying to make you the co-host. <laughs> she's listed as a co-host right now, Christina's. Okay. I, okay, then good. Thanks for noticing that, Mandy. So, I don't know okay, what so has happened. If, do what you need to do, um, reflect it in the minutes and we'll keep going. I have some reading to do, so. Um, okay, so at this time, we're going to move on to item three, the joint public hearing with community resources committee. I'm gonna open the meeting and then I'll turn it briefly over to- Not yet. No, oh, is it too early? Did we go no, so No, I need to call my meeting to order before we open the hearing. Before, oh, I don't open mine and then you open yours. Okay, well, well, good. No, you open yours, but I have to call my my actual meeting to order before oh, that's we true. the full hearing. So. Do you have I, your people? I do see I them. Do. So I'm gonna, seeing that there is a quorum of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council present, I am going to call the Community Resources Committee meeting, special meeting, joint with the Planning Board to order at 6.42 p.m. on June 10th. Um, at this time, uh, I will, you know, the, the whole virtual meeting thing has been done by Christine, so I'm not going to re, you know, repeat that, save some time, but I will call on all of our members to ensure that they can hear us and we can hear them. So when I say your name, please unmute yourself and say present, and we will then, after that, move on to the actual agenda. So, uh, Sarah Swartz. Present. Jalani Balmilne. You have to unmute Jalani. Yeah, where? So, we're gonna come back, Jalani. Where did she, oh, there she is. She's there, but we're not hearing her. So we're going to come back to Shalini. Evan Ross. I'm here. Uh, Steve Schreiber. I'm here. And uh, Mandy Jo Haneke is here. Let's try Shalini again. She, Shalini, she does not show mute. She, she is throwing her, she put her thumb up as if she can hear, but we cannot, he we cannot hear you when you speak, Shalini. I can't read her lips very well either. <laughs> she might want to bounce out and come back in again because it may not be reading her mic. Yes, yeah, so it might, I, she can hear us, but we can't hear her. So Shalini, maybe you can, uh, maybe there's something, an issue with your mic that it's not reading what you're saying and putting that through. Okay, so. Do you want to try re-logging on? <laughs> I think she's called in her IT help. I think she has to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I can see Shalene. Yeah. Yeah, and she can hear us. We just can't hear her. Don Hannon is here. Would he be helpful? Sean, Sean is here. I just asked him to come on board to try to fix my problem. So I'm in the middle of trying to text him. Speaking of which, Pam, how are you doing? I'm fine. I actually never left. I don't know if it's the energy outside. Everything was like flashing here on my end. I could hear, but I wasn't able to see anything. This is, this is Sean. Are you able to hear me now? Uh, yeah, we do. Okay, good. Welcome. So, Shalini, there should be um, a control where where you control you, where you mute and unmute to the upper right of that. 
there's a little um, up arrow and that allows you to select your microphone. You may want to just try um, if it lets you choose your basically built in Mac microphone as opposed to your headset. So you're definitely unmuted and your audio is connected. Um, it looks like it's using your built in microphone on your Mac. Sean, what else do you know about our our computer use and home setups? <laughs> I have a little dashboard. I can see what um, Zoom gives us a little dashboard, basically which device is connected, and it gives us some some quality information. So when there are questions about, um, basically, it shows kind of the bit rate and everything. So if people if people are experiencing trouble um, connecting or poor audio or video quality, we can go back and look and see if it was the connection or something like that. We don't get any more information beyond that. Um, Pam, is there a way you could take the charts down so we could see it? I can't see anything. I can see six people, but I can't see others. And, I'm and it, that's you can maneuver who you see and where it is on your screen. Do you see um, how how are the where are the videos right now? I see six people, including myself, in the right hand corner. Just up in the, so there's, if you go up to the top of it, mm -hmm. it'll give you little thumbnail things that you can play with to have different. Um, yeah, usually I can get nine, but it's okay. Oh, yeah, I, well, that's one of the buttons. You can push okay. different buttons, but also remember, I keep mine only for about six because I'm trying to look, um, I'm also looking at the panelist screen, but I'm. Okay, looking at the document and you there's an arrow so you can move back and forth if you want to see different people. Yes, thank you. I'm good. All right, so um, Should we move forward. I could open um, Mandy. So Shalini is is giving us the okay to move forward. Um, we will so I Shalini if you cannot get your audio working text me any questions you have until we can and we will help and sean will continue to help you maybe but you can hear us um and we will figure out a way to get you on through a phone call with me or something for audio when that becomes necessary yeah shalini you can also dial into the meeting if uh if that doesn't work and can she uh, can she raise her hand? Can we just test that? That's another way you know if she's going to text or if, if we're voting or oh, now she's there twice. She's logging in somewhere else. Is this so, working? Now we just oh. heard that, Shalini. Yay! Yay! Welcome! <laughs> Thank you, Shalini. So I think we're ready, Christine, to move on so you can go the item and then I will follow you. Okay. Um, great. Just checking the screen. All looks good. All right. Um, it is now 649 um, in accordance uh, with uh, the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resource Com uh, Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding proposed zoning bylaw, Article 14, temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath. To see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw by adding Article 14, temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath for the purpose of expediting the reopening and opening of retail establishments, personal care establishments, and food and drink establishments and associated accessory uses in the BG, BL, BVC, BN, and COM zoning districts and for pre-existing non-conforming uses in any district to help businesses to more quickly emerge from the economic disaster created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so, um, Mandy, do you want to open the hearing or is it open for you all or I does think this... I, I will declare that you're calling opening the joint public hearing 
joint with the community resources committee council's opening the community resources portion of that hearing okay so both are now open um and i'll say this uh to both crc and planning board please raise your hand if there are any member disclosures i see one hand but it's chris bestrup do you have a comment chris I wanted to say that um, I believe that Dave Zomek is going to have an introductory statement and then Rob Mora will present the, um, the RA14. So that will be under applicant's presentation. And okay. Um, I, might have a Shalini, I call she her hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to disclose that I have a and but I will not be applying for these temporary changes but just so you all know that I do have a downtown business did she freeze up for you man I didn't hear part of what she said she did freeze up Shalini can you repeat that yes so I have a business downtown that I want to just put, disclose but I will not be planning I'm not planning to apply for these temporary changes for my business okay Thank you. Uh, I see no other hands at this time. So I will, um, is our assistant man? Yeah, he is unmuted. David, are you there? Here I am. Can everybody hear me from uh, the I can see you. Welcome. Good, is, is, would this be a good time? Yes, this is a great time. And then we'll uh, call on Mr. Mora to speak. Sure, well, thank you very much for having me. And again, um, I will leave uh, obviously the details to Mr. Mora and Ms. Brestra. Um, so I think we're all aware of the devastating impacts COVID-19 has had on the Amherst business community, um, not only our downtown, but our village centers. Um, and I just wanted to make a few comments um, really about how uh, Article 14 evolved and, and how we got here. Um, so staff and I have worked very closely with the town manager to navigate the situation, and we've gotten tremendous impact, uh, input and feedback and support from the business community, the bid, the chamber, and, and the individual business owners. And I guess our fundamental question was, how can we help? We've seen the statistics on unemployment. We've seen and heard uh, from the bid and chamber. Uh, the council has heard. Various boards and committees have heard about um, the devastating effects of, of the pandemic. And out of a series of ongoing conversations, we identified critical ways that we could all work together to help our downtown and village center businesses in the recovery process. And I think I just wanted to read from Paul Bachman's uh, memo of, of uh, the 15th of May. You know, the purpose of the zoning article is to expedite the reopening of retail businesses, including restaurants, to more quickly emerge from the economic disaster created by the pandemic. And, and that's simply what we wanted to try to do and again, I kudos to Chris Brestrup and, and Rob Mora and their staffs and, and the collaborative way that this all came about with the business community. In those conversations, during those conversations, we identified three key areas that we thought the community needed to come together to assist in this process. Um, one of them um, was, and, and I'll get back to the zoning piece, but one of them was we needed flexibility in how the public ways were used. And, and we're very grateful that the council took action on that recently um, and um, uh, authorized the town manager to work uh, creatively to um, make sidewalks and other parts of the public way available for outdoor dining, et cetera. The other piece was in licensing. And uh, we knew um, with the alcohol component, uh, we were hopeful and, and luckily the ABCC took action recently to allow local approval um, of alcohol service. And uh, again, um, our Board of Licensed Commissioners is ready to begin reviewing um, applications already. And I believe those are gonna start happening tomorrow. Mr. Mora could speak more to that in a minute. And then finally was the zoning piece. Um, as we talked with the bid in the chamber, uh, we really felt as though there were things that we could do to temporarily suspend some of the complex zoning uh, pieces of, of, of our complex zoning that will allow businesses to be uh, up and running more quickly, particularly during the um, summer months. 
we need to, they need a shot in the arm. And, and our hope was if we could get them um, outdoor dining, outdoor seating, et cetera, that that would be a way to keep some in business to uh, allow for new businesses that might take hold this summer to get established before the fall. So that's really what brought us here. We believe that Article 14 is a step forward, a tool that we need, that the community needs in our tool belt um, to really expedite permitting and be responsive to the needs of the business community. I think what the words that came to mind when, when I've been part of this process is it's creative, it's collaborative, it's responsive, and we think it's responsible. So again, uh, we're thankful to the, to the um, partnership we have with the business community, with the bid, the chamber, um, and we hope that the CRC and the planning board um, will have um, you know, a thorough discussion of, of Article 14 tonight. So thank you. And uh, thank you for everybody for coming together and uh, putting this really this suite of actions that our community is gonna take to try to help in the rebuilding. So thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Mora. I see his mic is up, oh, there he is. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner. Uh, so uh, just to give a little update of, of what's been happening uh, since the governor's recent order, uh, things are moving pretty quickly. And uh, as early as uh, later on this week, or maybe already, you'll probably start to notice around town things happening, tents going up, uh, tables and chairs going out. And uh, we, we've been working with a number of establishments now. We have uh, 10 applications for outdoor dining, temporary outdoor dining fo following the governor's order. And seven of those are scheduled to be heard uh, tomorrow at a board of license commissioners hearing to extend the outdoor, uh, the sales of uh, service of alcohol to the outdoor dining, uh, extending the premises. So there's a potential that some or, or possibly all of those applicants, uh, those establishments could be operating this weekend if they uh, were ready to do so. I know that some of them will be if they are uh, successful tomorrow with the Board of License Commissioners. Uh, a little bit about the governor's order. Uh, it is really very specific to outdoor dining, temporary outdoor dining, table service, uh, with or without alcohol service uh, connected to that. Uh, and is, uh, is permitted at this point, based on that order, permitted to occur uh, between uh, now and November 1st when, when that would expire and uh, the condition that previously existed would go back into place. So that expansion would be, uh, would be terminated at that point uh, based on that order. Uh, we are looking to do a number of additional things by uh, proposing Article 14. Uh, it's not only food and drink establishments, uh, restaurants, uh, outdoor dining as an accessory use, but it's also retail, personal care establishments, and other types of accessory uses that could go along with any of those principal uses. Now, it doesn't extend any further than those three principal uses listed there on the screen, the, the retail establishments, personal care and food and drink establishments. Uh, no other principal uses are subject to this, uh, this bylaw amendment. And, and really, as Mr. Zomek mentioned, this is, this is an effort to uh, be able to react to uh, whatever might be happening out there. We are still not, I'm still not entirely sure of what to expect. Uh, we are trying to gather information about the various establishments uh, that we haven't heard from for <clears throat> a couple of months now, whether or not they're going to reopen, will be there, uh, or there'll be, uh, will there be vacant storefronts uh, where retail spaces or restaurants or personal care establish establishments may have been. So we want to be prepared for that. And this is, this is the way that we uh, feel is uh, uh, most suited to, to be able to react to those requests and, and allow proposals to move forward rapidly. Uh, so this, this bylaw amendment would allow not only an existing use to be altered or uh, expanded or changed in some way, but it does also allow a new use, a new, for example, restaurant to be located in a vacant storefront or a vacant building in these zoning districts and, and uh, allow the process to be reviewed uh, administratively by, by staff, uh, various group of staff as noted in the bylaw language um, under a very short time frame, 
uh, to get to a decision and hopefully allow the establishment, if, if appropriate, to move forward. Now, it doesn't eliminate any of the bylaw requirements, uh, specifically any standards, criteria, findings that have to be made. Uh, the, the staff will be responsible for ensuring that those, uh, those are addressed. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, put in some language regarding the design review board process and asking through this proposal that that process be suspended for temporary type or a non-permanent type of uh, uh, alterations or for signage and lighting that would be associated with some of those outdoor proposals, perhaps. Uh, anything that would be a permanent type of uh, alteration, say a, a brand new door installed or a movement of a window or door in an establishment, that would be something that uh, before we wanted to move ahead uh, and allow the, the building owner to, to make those changes, we would have design review board uh, review those if it was uh, otherwise subject to design review. Uh, by the bylaw. Um, that's a process that can happen fairly quickly compared to some of these other uh, permitting uh, uh, processes that we are used to. Uh, and just to talk about that for a minute, I know there, there may have been some confusion about uh, some earlier discussions about the normal process. Uh, wh whether it's a special permit or site plan review, uh, we have been talking about a, a duration for permitting of about 70 days. And that's the best case scenario when you uh, take a look at the advertising requirements, the noticing requirements, the uh, transmittal timeframe that the bylaw requires for all the town officials and other departments and boards to get a look at the proposal. Uh, a very tight hearing uh, process and assuming just one hearing on the matter. Uh, the staff has to generate, the planning staff has to generate a decision, uh, make it available for the board members to review and approve it, and then uh, it gets filed with the town clerk in an appeal period, a 20-day appeal period for special permits, uh, if that were the case, would uh, begin at that point. So uh, really best case, 70 days, uh, oftentimes it can go as long as 90 days under normal circumstances. And that's what we are concerned about. An applicant for any of these types of principal uses to help uh, get uh, business operating downtown again, filling uh, vacant spots uh, or uh, extending uh, uh, services so that they uh, can have the area that they need or the tables uh, needed to uh, have the business operate. Um, th this proposal would allow that to occur on a, a much faster schedule. Uh, all of the decisions uh, that are finally made and signed off by the building commissioner, uh, just like any other zoning decision, would be subject uh, to appeal. Uh, the, uh, if there's a building permit or other permits that are uh, issued uh, subsequent to this approval, that would also have the normal appeal process. Uh, that would be available uh, for it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so unless Chris Bestrup. I just wanted to mention that one of the reasons for doing this is because um, restaurants won't be able to operate um, Right now, they can't operate at all indoors, but when they finally open, they're not gonna be operating at full capacity. They're gonna be operating at 25% or maybe as much as 50%. I don't really know exactly what the governor has in mind, but they're not gonna be able to open at their, uh, or operate at their normal capacity. And so allowing them to operate um, outside is going to be really beneficial to them. It may mean you know life or death of their business. So I just wanted to add that in. And that's why we're doing this. Thank you. Um, at this time, I will open it up to the planning board and the CRC for questions. I'll be watching um, the queue here for raised hands. Uh, so if there's any questions and then just identify if you want a specific person to answer them. Um, uh, right now, I only see one hand. I'll start with Doug Marshall. <coughs> Hi, I have a question for Rob or Chris. Um, right now, um, 
if an existing restaurant goes out of business and a new restaurant wants to occupy the same space, is that subject to either site plan review or a special permit, or is that not something that requires action by either of those boards? Rob? Uh, yes, so right now, in our bylaw has two classifications, two categories of restaurants, class one and class two. Uh, essentially, it comes down to how late the establishment is open. The class one establishment in most cases is uh, permitted by site plan review, and a class two establishment is permitted by special permit. We do not have any locations in town where a restaurant of any type is permitted without a land use permit process, one of those. So it's contingent on a change in ownership that, pr that uh, prompts the new process. It's not a change of use from one type of use to another, is that correct? It could be either. Uh, so uh, a change of use, uh, say, a, a previously uh, being a retail establishment now proposing to be a restaurant, a class two restaurant would require a special permit for that to occur. Uh, if there is a uh, existing, uh, say, existing restaurant and a new owner takes over the establishment, there could very well be a condition, and we do have many of these a condition on the current special permit that it, the permit expire on the change of ownership. Okay. So that, that new owner of that business would need to apply for that process, start that process. Um, I don't see any hands right now. I'm just going to ask. So what if um, a restaurant wants to, an existing restaurant wants to relocate to a different space that may be empty um, or a couple of restaurants want to unite and work together? How would that work? So same thing, the process would, would apply. So the, the land use permit is connected to the location, the property, not to the business. So it doesn't move along with it. And that was one of the things we were hoping to be prepared for uh, with reduced seating or re reduced occupant load, expanding the space might be an option, particularly for personal care establishments. Now that we've got, uh, interestingly, I didn't realize this, there are 21 establishments in Amherst that we learned when we were reopening and helping with the reopening of these establishments. Uh, and you know, when you start removing uh, 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 stations for, for hair services, uh, it certainly is possible that as things get more active downtown, uh, or throughout town that uh, some of these vacant spaces that exist could be used for something like temporarily for uh, additional personal care services, salon or, or barbershop. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, I see two hands right now. First, I recognize Janet McGowan, and then I will call on Michael Burwistle. Um I have two questions. One of them is, um, are the permits or administrative approvals permanent if if a restaurant wanted to expand outdoor seating on privately held land um and they were given approval does that just stay forever um or will they be asked to come back and renew or something you know that's my first question and the second one is have any personal care businesses are they asking have they been talking or talking to you about working outside you can take them in any order. Thank you. Uh, so the administrative permit could be either way. It could be temporary, it could be permanent. I think it's going to be looked at case by case. Uh, um, certainly a temporary situation that, that includes maybe partial use of a public way or a sidewalk would more likely be a, a temporary condition where we would expire that, that administrative approval. Uh, we're seeing parking lots uh, in, on private property be uh, requested to be used for, for temporary dining. That would be a situation that would absolutely want to expire and have that be just for this uh, during this period of time uh, because we're losing parking spaces and once the establishment opens back up, we would obviously need the parking again. Uh, so, you know, but there might be a, a, a patio that could be constructed or 
uh, something more permanent on a private property that I wouldn't want the business owner to be discouraged from investing in, uh, not knowing whether or not it would be able to be used the following year. So I think there could be situations with outdoor dining that are more permanent uh, on private property. Uh, there certainly could be other types of approvals, uh, like a brand new restaurant. So a brand new restaurant moving into a vacant storefront would need to be able to rely on this administrative approval and not uh, not have to come back to to a board six months from now uh, after they've uh, you know set up or, or, or furnished and and maybe made made changes to a a, a location. So. Uh, it could be both, and I think it's uh, it's going to be uh, up to the staff to uh, view those case by case and which which ones are more permanent, uh, being presented as a permanent solution, uh, and and those that are uh, more temporary in nature. Um, the personal care establishments have not asked. I have not been asked uh, to have any type of activity outdoors. I have in the past interestingly enough, uh, to use parking spaces, uh, but nothing had ever come of that. Uh, so I think it's one of those things that just stuck in my mind when we were drafting this is that it could be possible, uh, along with what we talked previously about maybe utilizing some other uh, vacant uh, interior space if needed. Thank you. Um, I see Michael Burtwistle's hand. Michael, you're still muted, so unmute. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, I, first of all, I think this is a, a, an excellent proposal uh, and I'm totally prepared to support it. I have one question about it relative to the uh, possibility of public input into a decision make, into the administrative decision being made, particularly in light of the fact that some of these decisions may be long-term as opposed to simply a six-month decision. Uh, what kind of opportunity is, for, is there for abutters and or the general public to make their positions known prior to your uh, administrative approval of such, a, of such a request? Yes, this proposal would not have, uh, <clears throat> have a step included that would uh, would take into account public uh, comment. <clears throat> um, these decisions, uh, at least at, at the ones that we've already started looking at for, for outdoor dining are happening really quickly. Uh, there, like I said, we have about 12 applica uh, 10 applications so far just in the first couple of days uh, and, and we are not, uh, we are not uh, slowing those down. We are moving those right along as fast as we can to get these businesses uh, operating in the way that uh, would, would bring their customers back. So it's not really designed to, to have that type of input at that stage. Now, any decision that's made, any permit that's granted is subject to appeal. Uh, so it, within 30 days, uh, a, a butter that wasn't happy with something that was uh, approved would have the right to appeal that decision to the zoning board of appeals and, and potentially get the decision reversed. That would be, you know, that would kind of be what's available, the tool that's available to them. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, out of order, Chris Bestrup. I just want to say I do see two other planning board members, Doug and Jack, and I just want to remind CRC that this is a joint hearing. So if they have a question to please raise their hand and they'll be in the queue. Um, Chris? So I just wanted to mention the fact that um, we have a lot of experience um, with permitting of these types of uh, facilities downtown and elsewhere in town. Um, all of these uh, permits come with conditions and we can look back at um, conditions that were uh, imposed on similar activities or similar types of restaurants and, um, and glean um, you know, suggestions about what kinds of conditions might make uh, a certain type of restaurant um, uh, acceptable to abutters. Um, and some of the things might be, you know, if they have live in entertainment, that the level of noise that emanates from the property at the property line, you know, is below a certain decibel level. Um, 
anything having to do with queuing or waiting or anything like that. Those are the, usually the things that people are most worried about, that there's going to be uh, a line of people outside making noise late at night. And, you know, we can, we can control that, having people wait in their cars, having people not come until their reservation is ready. So we're, um, we're aware of the kinds of things that abutters uh, would be concerned about. And I think that um, we would incorporate those into decisions about these facilities. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I call on Doug Marshall and Jack Jemsek is next. Yeah, I had, uh, I guess, two questions. One is since the planning board and other town bodies will continue to meet through this period on a fairly regular basis. Uh, what is the plan of staff to inform the planning board in particular uh, about decisions that you have made uh, so that we can see how things are running? Uh, that's the first question. And the second question is, if uh, for some reason we objected to a decision that had been made uh, would we have standing to appeal that decision or what would be our avenue to reverse it? Thank you. Uh, Chris, I saw your hand or Rob. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the planning board uh, could be made aware of uh, by report at uh, each of their meetings. Uh, I also, um, had thought that maybe uh, we could possibly uh, present or display all of the approvals that are made under Article 14 on our website to make them publicly available and, and uh, those would know that those occurred and the dates that are associated with it. I think I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. Um, if the planning board objects to a decision that is made, uh, they certainly can uh, appeal that decision. Uh, and uh, I would expect that if there was something not working properly with this, uh, a recommendation to the council to either uh, suspend it or alt, uh, amend it again or do something uh, would be appropriate. Thank you. Um, I'll call on Jack Jemsek. Uh, hello. Um, I just want to say this is this seems to be very important um, bylaw being proposed, and it, you know I would love to have seen this um, presented to the board, you know, a couple of weeks ago even, you know. But uh, I think we have you know one of the better planning departments, and I appreciate what you know Rob, Dave, and Chris have done to to push this through. Um, and I also, I think in terms of awareness, uh, I would encourage the town to, uh, you know, publish, you know, a very clear, you know, article, you know, within the Gazette or other uh, publication, certainly on the website, uh, regarding the notice of, of what's going on with this, you know, dumb it down, you know, simplify it, uh, that, you know, there are so many businesses that may enter in this and just let them know that this is a possibility for so many you know restaurants in town that that are hanging on uh so that's that's my only suggestion is you know notifying the town in in a way that you know everybody's aware that you know th these things need to happen they could happen uh and again in a very simplified manner Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Um, I'm going to open it up to um, public comment. I'm not seeing other hands up. I just wanted to say one thing today. I read in the paper, um, Boston, I mean, all towns are, are dealing with this rapid fire, um, but Mayor Walsh from Boston, um, he had a quote today that said um, in concerning you know, letting the public know and keeping, you know, this rolling forward. He said, this is not a typical community process, but conversations are going to continue. And I think what he's saying is, you know, they're going to keep 
listening and talking and I assume our town will be doing the same thing collecting data from you know everything from noise complaints to um, keeping their eyes open and just seeing when things aren't working um, he also mentioned that they will be posting a list online note uh, listing all restaurants that had got approval as of now they already have over 500 applications and they've approved 200 um, just to put me but um, I liked when Mr. Moore, when you said putting something online, I think that's really important so that people know there's one place that they can watch it. But it also, as I opened a public comment, part of this is the public needs to know that this is happening and they're open. You don't want to build it and then not have them come. So as I open it, I know the bid in the chamber, I can see representatives there. You know, I assume this list will be replicated in different ways on their websites and that it will be advertised where the public can find out where you can go and what is offered. So um, thank you for that. So I'm going to switch over to uh, the public. I'm looking at the attendees list. Um, I see one hand up right now, but if there's any other um, comments that want to be made, I see, okay, I see a couple. Um, now would be the time. And also, Pam, let me know if there's any phone call-ins. I don't um, see so any phone at this point. Okay, thank you. I recognize Dorothy Pam. Okay. And then I see Claudia and Gabrielle. So we'll go in that order at this point. Hello. Hi, Dorothy. I have a couple of questions and a comment. Um, uh, if you're a business owner who's closed and can't uh, uh, open, can't afford to open right now, you could they could lose their space. Or is there any way that an existing owner that would like to open but is having difficulties could hold on to their space in some way. That's number one. Um, and uh, the other one is, uh, why not consult, the, there's a, a section where you consult with um, solicit comments from other applicable public officials and staff. And I'm just thinking, why not include the head of the design review board at that time? Because um, aesthetics do matter and how things look d does matter. Um, in terms of whether the public wants to come and to do business with them. So I, I am worried about the new business thing. I understand the difficulties, uh, but I still think allowing new businesses to put up permanent structures with absolutely none of the regular review is not a good idea. And being told you can appeal means that somebody's going to have to pay for a lawyer. So I, I do have some worries about that, particularly um, depending upon what kind of a business it is. I mean, I'm, I'm worried about a new new business person that has not done business in downtown that you and the, aren't familiar with. So you're not sure how they're gonna behave. And then they permanently get in there, build something, and it's really hard to get them out. So that's it. Thank you. I see uh, Chris Bestrup with her hand up. So I assume she might have an answer back for this. Well, um, we do know that um, the design review board would still be involved in reviewing any permanent structures. So if someone were building a deck or a shed or anything that is a permanent structure um, to allow this kind of business to go on, that would still be approvable by uh, the design review board. It's just the temporary things okay. like um, signs and lights and uh, that type of thing that wouldn't be approved by the, that wouldn't be reviewed by the DRB. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll call on Claudia, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Great, hi, Claudia Pasmani, Executive Director of the Amherst Area Chamber. Uh, you are in receipt of a letter that we, we also submitted earlier today. I know it was a little late, but we are uh, grateful to submit the letter as well. Firstly, I wanna thank uh, the team, to Rob and Paul, Christine and Dave, uh, the, as part of the chamber and also with the bid, we've been meeting with, engaging with the town for several months. So I wanted to say to Jack's point, we absolutely would have loved to have made this happen sooner, but you know, this has been such an ever evolving situation. And I believe, um, and meeting with the town, trying to keep up with the phases when we're reopening is going to happen um, and responding while trying to engage in a new process. Um, you know, it just took time. And so here we are. So I'm just so appreciative that the town really listened and, and, and not unlike any other town in the US, certainly not across Massachusetts, um, we need to provide this life preserver. Uh, this is really one of the last lifelines for a lot of our businesses. 
we have seen through some of our micro grant funding, the extreme amount of pressure that they are on, they are literally hanging on. Um, $1,000 is helping them right now. So imagine they're just going to maybe be a third of what they were uh, when they open on the street. Some of them may only have several tables, uh, you know, and whatever service we're talking about. But, and at the chamber, we've been kind of operating on this response, reopening recovery trifecta. And, um, and in our, all our collaborations with both the town and the bid partners, and this is part of that reopening. Um, and we can't get to recovery if we can't give our businesses every opportunity. So we've been responding and now we have an opportunity to reopen and give them every possibility for success. Um, and again, you've talked about this, we have to get creative. And I so appreciate Rob and Dave's team working with our restaurants and businesses. It's been mostly restaurants, 10 so far, um, that I understand, tents, tables, chairs, sidewalks, closed streets, parking. Um, but I have seen the extreme care and caution our businesses have taken to this point. They are taking this very seriously. Some have chosen to not even reopen right away. Um, they are being as cautious as possible and they want to take, and they are taking advantage of every opportunity we are offering and the bid is offering. So they are ready to be and to work together with you. And I also, and to Dorothy's point, um, but in a different way, I would also suggest that keeping in mind, they're going to be spending an out, they're going to be outlaying even more money to make an outdoor seating area possible. Um, some of them won't have tables that can move outside. They won't have umbrellas, barriers, all the things that it might take to set up outside. So here they're willing to go through an, you know, an additional cost to make ends meet and to make it work. Um, so I believe they will have the very best intentions. I think they're going to do it under, uh, under the code that we set. I'm really proud of what I have seen. Um, and I know that we will happily share that list. I do believe a list, a public list is important as well. And I know the chamber would be very happy to publicize that list. So thank you for your time. And thank you for both committees for joining tonight. Thank you. Um, I see Chris Bestrup. Do you have a comment, Chris? I do. Am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Okay. Oh, so I you. wanted to mention a few things in response to um, Dorothy's comment about whether businesses might lose their spaces. So there are a couple of things about that. One is that um, I understand that some of the landlords are working with um, restaurants that might uh, otherwise not be able to pay their rent and um, you know, trying to um, make arrangements with them uh, with regard to rent. Um, another thing is that we are uh, hoping to get some money from Community Development Block Grant. Um, it's additional to the normal amount of money that we get and we're hoping to be able to use that um, for micro grants for really small businesses that have five or fewer employees um, and whose um, income is of a certain level. So, um, so that's another thing. Then the bid has a foundation um, and they raised a few hundred thousand dollars and they, they have also been giving grants to some of these businesses to help them with expenses to help them get over the hump. And in addition to that, um, the Solomon Foundation, which we recently found out about, um, is possibly able to help us with some of the um, infrastructure that we're going to need to make our downtown more beautiful and more appealing for outdoor dining. And we're going to be applying for that grant and we're going to be working with the, um, with the bid on that. So, so all of those things we hope will help and perhaps the Solomon Foundation will be able to help us with purchase of umbrellas and planters and things like that. So, um, you know, we're really, we're very excited about this. We're hoping that it, um, you know, really works out and that Amherst becomes a very uh, vital, exciting place this summer. Just wanted to let you know about those efforts. Thank you, Chris. Very good to know. I'm going um, down the line. Okay, I, uh, Gabrielle Gould, I call on you. Welcome. If you want to introduce yourself, you're still on mute. 
Hi, Gabrielle Gould from the Amherst Business Improvement District. Thank you all for this uh, meeting tonight. I do want to stress that Amherst, um, this conversation is about Amherst wide, not just downtown. I think that's very important. We have other town centers with wonderful businesses that we need to support. I also want to stress the fact that Amherst was hit three weeks before any other place in Massachusetts. With the closing of our university and the colleges, we lost, we had the rug pulled out from us. So we are three weeks behind. And I stress this with every time I am on the phone with Secretary Keneally, the time that I have had in front of Governor Baker, um, we lost our July and August. So while the rest of the world is trying to get their summer back, we lost ours when we lost April and May. So our businesses have been hit a lot harder than many, many other municipalities throughout Massachusetts. Um, I think I, I, am, I am speaking uh, confidently that all communities are looking at zoning, uh, temporary zoning uh, amendments like this. I am um, on the phone constantly with communities across Massachusetts hearing what they are doing and I'm more than happy to answer questions about that. Every day for our businesses is a make it or break it. Um, we ha have given them um, some time and some hope through the Downtown Amherst Foundation, which the Chamber of Commerce and the bid have created together. We have raised almost $300,000. We have given 150,000 of that in round one to small businesses. And we are planning on doing the same thing again in about a week's time. The application process is op open right now. Again, that is, that is hope and that is some time. And what they need now is action from the town to support them. And I have to say the town has been remarkable in the action and the work that they have done to date and to this meeting. Um, and I really think that we need to support Chris, Rob and their team. They know what they're doing. They know their, their business and they know this community and they have experience and uh, it is time to let them do this. Um, this is an economy and a pandemic that is unprecedented. And if a new business is willing to come in and take a space that is empty, um, I think we should be on bended knee and that we should be really excited to have them come in. I don't think that there's a landlord in the entire town of Amherst, the entire state of Massachusetts, who believes that there are people knocking and banging at the door for empty spaces. So if these spaces do become empty, and look, the James Beard Foundation did a, a study and they said that 80% of independently owned restaurants are on the verge of collapse due to this. We are going to see attrition no matter how hard we work and no matter how much we do. But if there is some entrepreneur, if there is someone who has what it takes to come into this town and wants to open a business in a space that we have empty, I really do hope that we have our arms open to them. Um, and I just wanna address the public comment and the abutters. I, I love this as a community member, when I get an abutters notice and I get to have a say in what goes on next door to me, I think it's very, very important but I cannot uh, stress the expedience of this and what our businesses need. Every day is a day that they are making zero dollars. We have grant applications coming in right now. And one of the questions we ask them is their net and their gross for May. It is zero. And no matter how benevolent your landlord is, your landlords still have mortgages of their own to pay and bills of their own to pay. We need to get behind these businesses and we need to show them support. And beauty is absolutely something that we need. We all want it. Um, the bid just spent a lot of money getting all the flowers put into town. We're cleaning the streets. We're here for that. But today is a time to make a decision to support our businesses and they need our support more than they have ever had before. Thank you. Thank you. So in uh, the public, I see no more. Pam, just double checking, no phone calls. I see none. Okay, so back to the two boards or the committee and the board. Um, at this time, are there um, any final questions uh, that need to be asked? Oh, we said afternoon. Um, Mandy, I I um, call on Mandy. Thanks. Where are um, you? No, I, I just wanted to hear from from Rob or Chris, um, you know, we've heard a lot about a butters notices or notice to, you know, close by businesses or landlords or owners of, of properties that are near an applicant's property. And I, I am curious if to hear what notice would take, you know, what your thoughts are on that notice and whether it would add more time to 
being able to grant the um, the administrative approvals and the requests um, and how much time that might add and and not just time but maybe cost to either the applicant or the town to do that in in a manner that that might normally be done or even in a modified manner um, given what the purpose of this bylaw is um i see chris's hand up and rob's um i saw chris's first but either of you can answer <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that the normal course of events is that we get an abutters list um, of property owners within 300 feet of a property on which something is proposed. So that means property owners are the owner of the property and the building, not the tenants. We only get, um, we only require tenant notifications if something's going to happen in the particular building. So for instance, Ann Whalen Apartments, if something's going to happen in Ann Whalen Apartments, we require the owner of the building to notify all the tenants. But if something's going to happen at the Bang Center or Panda East, we notify the Amherst Housing Authority and they may choose to notify their tenants. So, um, so the normal course of events is we get a list of abutters, property owners from the assessor's office, and we send out the same notice that we put in the paper, we send to the property owners and they may choose to notify their tenants or not. Um, in this case, it would take um, extra time, it would take um, money, it would take staff time to put a butters notices together. We would have to draft the abutters notice, we would have to get the abutters list, we'd have to have that um, print all the notices, stuff them in the envelopes and mail them. And by the time um, someone received the mail, as we all know, mail is it's kind of slow these days. I'm not sure why, but in any event, um, by then it's quite possible that Rob would have already granted the approval. Um, I feel like it's really not, um, given the time frame that we're dealing with, we're trying to do these things quickly because the businesses are going under quickly. Um, and so spending time on a butter's notices is probably not um, where we want to spend our time. And yeah, so that's all I'll say right now. Thank you, Chris. I do see Rob's hand up. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, uh, Chris covered it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Shalini, I see her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that for the morale of the businesses and uh, just the fact that we have so much i mean i think amherst is the highest unemployment because we rely on the restaurant business and for those reasons the morale uh i just learned the fact that it's the chains restaurants are not being affected it's our local businesses that are getting affected by this and so if we want our downtown to survive whatever is left I think we really do need to send out that message to the businesses that we have your back, we're there for you. And, and, I, and, and as Chris said earlier, they have the experience, our staff has the experience to look at each issue, come up with solutions that based on past experiences that they have to make sure that everything is done in a way that's respectful to the people involved. And the last thing I wanna say is I just wanna appreciate uh, you know, I don't know if you take enough time to appreciate the people, our staff, and Dave, and Chris, and Rob, and everyone working behind the scenes. Yeah, thank you. And I really want to, I mean, how lucky are we to have the kind of people at BID and the Chamber who've done so much. I mean, the $300,000 they've raised for the businesses, and um and I also want to appreciate us. We made it work, you know, the planning board and the CRC, and we, you know, we, we're moving things along. So as Jack said, let's find ways to let the businesses know this is happening and let the public know that these are the uh, safety measures and this is how it's safe for you to, to come out and support our businesses. We have to all work together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob, your hand is up. Do you have an additional, or no, it's going to click down. So I'm not seeing any additional um, hands. Oh, I see one. Um, Janet, 
sorry, it sucks clicking around here. Uh, Janet McGowan. Thank you. Um, I do. I want to say how much I appreciate everyone's efforts and the urgency of the situation. It's it's obvious going around town. Um, I've been excited to see Mission Cantina putting their fence up and Johnny's. I think my my question, I was, I was thinking about how to frame this, is how can the question for me is how do we solve, how do we achieve several goals? How can we get help to businesses as quickly as possible? And also make sure that neighboring businesses and residents have a say of some kind at some point. And how can we fix problems that come up later that you know aren't anticipated? Um, you know, problems can emerge with noise, loud music, parking issues, you know, getting from one business to the other. Um, nearby businesses may be affected by some, you know, quick permits. Um, lighting might affect people. Um, you know, there might be problems with new businesses. I hate to mention the word Porta, but I don't think anyone expected that. And so, um, and you know, I actually have lived near a restaurant that had outdoor seating and it's very loud. And so, you know, my question is, how do we achieve those three goals? Getting businesses started and up and running, making sure that the businesses that are nearby and residents have a say in the process and how do you fix problems that come up? And so the amendments I suggested were not to have the town give notice to the abutters and not just the property owners because that person could be in a different state, but to have the people applying give notice to the abutters. So that was one way of sort of, you know, and it could just be a notice on the door. And so that was one idea. Um, another idea that I had was just to make the permit temporary, a six month permit. So at some point when things are slower and you know, the winter has come and I think the crisis is still going to be going on in the winter, but there's time to kind of revisit the permits, see if there's conditions that need to be changed, um, or maybe one or two might just have just not worked out at all. And so that was my second suggestion for amendment is not to make them permanent permits, but temporary. And I can see the point about a restaurant opening, not wanting to go under a temporary permanent permit. I'm sure, I mean, I would assure everybody, I think the planning board, the ZBA, the building commissioner all want that to work in six months. They're not gonna pull a permit for no reason. As we've been talking, I was thinking about, you know, how do we achieve these three goals? And we wanna get people going. I, you know, I'm actually, you know, I'd love to have a taco from Mission Cantina on Saturday. Um, and I'm beginning to wonder if a way to achieve that would be to have permit conditions that there is going to be a six month review, review of the permit or the administrative action that people before that review are notified people within 300 feet and they would have an opportunity to have they can have some permit and that the permit may be altered with new conditions. And so that would take care of all my concerns and try to like make sure that people have a say if problems are coming up, they have a chance to talk about it and then we have a chance to fix it. So I just wonder, I wanna offer that to the group and to the town staff as a suggestion about making it a permit condition that in six months there'll be a review of the permit that people within 300 feet, anybody, not just property owners are notified about the review and that the, the permit may be altered to fix problems. This, that's just an idea I've had as we've been talking. I am um, not seeing any more hands. Uh, so at this point, I could close the, uh, uh, we could close the public hearing part. Sean A. Sean A just raised her hand. Oh, is she? Um, thank you, Shalini. Yeah, I, I just wanted to offer the suggestion, you know, that, uh, to, this, uh, to the suggestions that Janet made, especially the one about getting, uh, notifying the neighboring businesses and resident or residents. I think that the staff could maybe just offer that as a recommendation to the applying businesses. Hey, it'll be a good protocol for you or being a good uh, neighbor to let people know. And if anything, they might get ideas from the neighbors how to make it work so but i don't think we should make that a compulsory thing but i think just having a list of uh, a protocol that might help the businesses um, kind of work with with each other with that idea of 
working together could be something we can add or staff can add, sorry. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, uh, we could make a move to close the public hearing. Um, and then we could have any other last final comments or a motion. Um, I see Jack. Uh, I would move that we uh, close this public hearing. Um, I'm not sure what other jargon is necessary <laughs> to move it through, but. You'd wanna, are you making a motion? I to am, I am. Approve to recommend. I think that's what we're doing. We're recommending. Yes. I, I think we're closing the hearing first before we do the motions for recommendations and all. We can do it that way. So at this point, we'll just close the public hearing. Um, we usually do it at the same time. So CRC wise, do we second that and just- yeah, So I, I think we need, we might need two motions, one from each board to close the public hearing. And then we could, if we get them both simultaneously, we could then just vote all at once through one roll call. So I'll look for a second hand from a CRC if one of them would like to close the, also close the public hearing. CRC? Well, what? <laughs> yeah. Evan? Sure. I will move to close the hearing. So right. Evan will make the motion for CRC. And Jack made it for planning board. And I see Doug Marshall. I'll call on Doug Marshall. Is that a second, Doug, for planning yeah, board? I will second it. Great. And do I have a second for CRC? I, I will second it. OK, great. <laughs> to make that easy. And then do you actually do a vote on that? or We do roll call votes virtually. Okay. We, yeah, like we usually do it together. So I'll do planning board first. This is just to close the public hearing. Uh, Michael Burtwistle. Yes. Okay. Maria Chow. Yes. Uh, Jack Jemsick. Yes. David Levenstein. Yes. Doug Marshall. Affirmative. Janet McGowan. Yes. And myself, yes. So that's seven. Mandy. And Evan Ross. Yes, sorry. Sarah <laughs> Schwartz. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Shalini Balmil. Yes. And Mandy Johanneke is a yes. So that's unanimous for CRC. So I believe, Christine, that the joint public hearing is fully closed. OK, so that's closed. So at this point, uh, Planning board, if they want to make a motion of some type, I'll watch for a hand. Uh, Michael, Art Whistle. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm interested in uh, Janet's uh, notion of a kind of review of the uh, administrative uh, ad uh, administrative approval of uh, of permits at some point. Um, I, I also do not want to put anything in the way of reopening businesses as soon as possible and as liberally as possible. Uh, I am concerned a little bit that uh, the rush to get things going might end up with some kind of negative consequences. And I don't know what they would be. And I, I don't think they would be. But I, I would, I, I'm hesitant to subject neighbors, whether they're residents or whether they're land or, uh, uh, property owners, of the impact of a, an unwanted outdoor dining area without any recourse. And I think there, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for some kind of review after the outdoor dining season is over, let's say November 1st or December 30th or what, whatever date you want to have that some, at some point when we're no longer having any outdoor dining to assess how it's been. Uh, and looking at the, uh, the way in which the university is now tentatively planning to sort of reopen in the fall, uh, even the fall will not be a full season of activity in downtown Amherst, apparently. It's hard to tell for sure, but that seems to be the way it's moving. 
So I think it would be perfectly reasonable uh, to uh, put a, uh, um, a section into this, uh, into Article 14, that calls for a review uh, at at some point. And I think I'd defer to Janet to suggest what that, how that ought to be worded and, and where that ought to go in. Uh, I, again, I'm in, totally in favor of this, of this uh, bylaw, but I would like to have that, that provision um, as, a, as a fail safe. Um, I'll call on um, Shalini. She's the only hand I see up. Yeah, I also want us to consider the consequences of not taking timely action. We heard from Chris that in order to make this process move in 10 days, it is not going to be possible to uh, notify the people. And if you do want to go through that process of notifying people and uh, and not giving people the care guarantee the kind of guarantee they need to make the investments to that this was not going to be just short lived as Rob explained. I just want us to consider the consequences of not doing what all the other communities around us are doing and if the businesses who might be considering opening in our locations in the empty places would not want to go to the other places where the communities are making it easier and what our downtown is going to look like once the existing businesses close because we did, we were hesitant we were afraid that something might go you know crazy with with this i call on evan ross thank you uh so you know i think one thing we have to bear in mind throughout all of this is what we know and what we heard tonight from um, Claudia of the Amherst Chamber and from uh, Gabrielle of the Amherst Business Improvement District about uh, the ways in which our local business community and especially the restaurant industry is struggling. And the design of this uh, and the intent of this is to help them reopen, help them recover, and help our local economy recover. And so I am incredibly wary of any amendment that could place additional burdens or additional uncertainties onto our local business communities. And that's where, while I understand the intent of some of the suggestions and changes that have been made, what I see in them are additional burdens and hurdles and uncertainty for our local business community. Um, I, I'm really uncomfortable with any suggestion that it should be incumbent on the business owner to notify all of butters. I think especially if you look at our restaurant community, a number of which are non-English speaking, a number of which already struggle to understand our complex regulatory and permitting framework, uh, to ask them to be responsible for notifying the butters, I think is an, an unreasonable burden to place on top of people who are already struggling. And any type of six month review, any type of uh, situation in which permits could change down the road, that only adds uncertainty and anyone who uh, runs a small business will tell you the biggest challenge to any business is uncertainty. And so I think given the upfront investment that it takes to open a restaurant, given the investment to do any of this, I mean, Claudia was talking about, or maybe it was Gabrielle was talking about uh, having to buy tables and umbrellas. There's investment, there's financial investment that goes into all of this. And so what we need to make sure we're providing not only is expediency, but certainty. I think the certainty is almost as important as the expediency. Um, and some of the amendments that have been proposed, I think, will undermine that certainty and create a much more difficult situation in what is already a really difficult situation for business owners who are just scraping by. And so uh, I, I would outright oppose uh, any of those changes because I think that we need to make sure that this can actually live up to its intent of making it easier for businesses to open and recover during uh following this epidemic. Thank you. Mandy. Yeah, um, I, I also want to point out and and I would ask um, Christine or Dave or Rob to correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, this bylaw applies to three types of establishments, retail, personal care, food and drink, but we already have as as the members have seen uh, Governor Baker's emergency order 
that applies to food and drink establishments. And that order would trump whatever, my understanding is that order would trump whatever we put in this bylaw regarding food and drink establishments. And I think we need to keep that in mind because as long as that order is in place, even if we, and I'm not saying I agree with putting these in because I actually support much of what Evan said about certainty and expediency and costs and all that Shalini and Evan were saying, but most of the concerns I've heard about the, the need for coming back for um, notice and giving abutters the, the, the ability to um, respond or comment on a proposed application relate to concerns regarding food and drink establishments and dining outside, not necessarily having a sidewalk sale from a retail establishment or um, a personal care establishment cutting hair outside or doing nails outside. And so if we put that in, which I don't agree with doing, but if we did, it wouldn't actually affect the permits that are being granted right now for food and dining because Governor Baker's emergency order, I believe, trumps that. Um, if I'm wrong, I would ask that Chris or Rob correct me, but this bylaw is in addition to that, but cannot um, cannot impose things extra beyond what Governor Baker's order has done. So I don't even think, beyond the fact that I don't want them in there, because I think I agree with everything Evan and Shalini said, if we did put it in there, it wouldn't actually have the effect people are looking for. Um, so I'm going to, uh, Chris Bestrup and Rob Mora both have their hands up. Uh, Chris came up first, but either of you. So I just wanted to say that um, according to um, our attorney, uh, Joel Bard, he felt that this um, zoning bylaw had more strength than the governor's order because the governor can rescind his order any time that, you know, it just goes away. Um, it, it is, I believe, not the case that the governor's order trumps our local zoning bylaw. Um, if we vote this in, this will be the law of Amherst. Of course, we have to comply with um, the features that the governor has put in place or the requirements. But um, I think that our zoning bylaw would, would actually be the stronger of the two um, regulations. So Rob may have something to add to that. Mr. Mora. I, I just wanted to add that the, the governor's order allows the outdoor dining to occur until November 1st. So everything that we're issuing, reviewing now, and, and we've what we've done is we've created a bunch of draft uh, permits uh, ready to go as soon as the Board of License Commissioners review and makes their decision. And those permits are coming with a long list of conditions. And one of those <clears throat> is that it will expire November 1st. Now, November 1st, there might be an option to extend it under Article 14 or sometime between now and then if, if the establishment wants to look at it longer term or even going past that date or if the governor rescinds it beforehand. Uh, but I also wanted to mention that with all of these establishments that the the practice, uh, particularly with the Zoning Board of Appeals, is to uh, create a management plan and condition the permit on the management plan. The management plan is designed to respond to all the findings that are in our bylaws. So everything that everyone's talking about here, light, noise, uh, or other things like trash and recycling, all those things are handled through the Zoning Board process. I sit with the Zoning Board and we draft these conditions for all of these establishments. And the permits are designed to operate so that the operation complies with uh, and meets the, satisfies the findings and the criteria and standards that are in our bylaw. And if it's not happening for whatever reason, that's where we get involved. And we do this every day. We, we called out for a, a, a situation and look at it to see what's not working. And I can tell you just I mean, I've been talking personally with these uh, these restaurants over the past several days. They are all interested in doing the, doing this right, uh, and they they are looking at their management plans. They are updating them, revising them to to address the outdoor dining. They are ensuring that staff are tip certified for servers and crowd control managers in place in case lines start to form. So they are taking this very seriously, and that's that's the 
the process we've established here for many years and and has has proven to work well. Porta was mentioned. There are exceptions to that, but we have the ability to um, to work with the the business owner to adjust and make improvements as needed to make sure that they're in compliance with their permit. I don't see this being any different than the conditions that would be associated with a uh, zoning board special permit for this type of establishment. Uh, Mr. Moore, just to sort of play it out, just so people will hear from you. Um, so let's just say there is a parking lot that now has a restaurant. Um, and there are some complaints happening over a weekend that the noise is too loud or there's too many cars going the wrong way or whatever the complaint is. Um, I assume police might be, you know, might be get the complaints or town hall. Is there a system being evolved to collect these complaints and then who would be tasked to sort of investigate it and where would it fall in priorities? We already have that system in place. So we are designed uh, to be a complaint response department. Uh, we are not proactively enforcing any of our bylaws, any of our regulations. We are there to respond to complaints. And so that can be done a number of different ways, whether it's uh, you know previously in person or a phone call. We have an online uh, location where a complaint can be filed those complaints are immediately responded to no matter what they are. Even if they're found to be, you know, something that we're not addressing or to call and say, no, we don't regulate that. They are immediately responded to by a code enforcement officer. Um, I'm noticed on those. The uh, lead code enforcement officer, John Thompson is uh, noticed on those. And then they're divided up depending on what their subject is. Sometimes they are directed to DPW for uh, you know, a sidewalk that has brush overgrown. Uh, sometimes it's a, more of a housing matter uh, or a health matter where we need a health inspector to get involved in if there's a restaurant related issue. I completely expect that there will be issues. There will be complaints. There will be questions. There will be adjustments that need to be made. We're designing these, these uh, you know, some of these in parking lots where we're trying to look at traffic flow and access and waiting uh, and signage. And I think, you know, in discussions that I'm having, I think it's pretty well known that this is our best effort to, to get this, uh, this operating, but we're putting in a lot of conditions to ensure that uh, if something needs to be done, we'll, you know, we'll be there to help the uh, establishment figure out how to do that. Thank you. Um, I recognize one hand. I see Janet McGowan. Thank you. Um, I, my concern is, I mean, my concern is that there's really no public participation in this process. And so, um, you know, even today we actually had uh, the members of the public were Dorothy Pam, our town counselor, the bid who's, you know, wholly backing this and, and the chamber. And I, and I recognize how hard everybody's working. So uh, it's very conceivable that this, very few people had notice of this hearing. Um, so, and I actually think amending the bylaw um, and adding some extra language may just delay approval. And so I, I did draft some language that um, I'm not completely wedded to, but I was, I'm wondering if um, the planning board would recommend or Christine Brestrup or um, the building, uh, Rob Mora would be agree to add this language as a permit condition for the review. And so if you want me to, I could read it hopefully very slowly um, and see what people think about that. And, um, and so the language I was thinking about maybe putting into each permit, you know, it, here it is. Um, after six months, each, or 180 days, sorry. After 180 days, each administrative approval and permit will be reviewed with notice to all the butters within 300 feet um, and the conditions may be adjusted after review. Should I read that again or is that? No, I'm just looking for any hands for support or comments. I'm seeing no hands at this time. So I'm suggesting this as a permit condition, which will give you the chance um, to go back and say, oh, we missed something or someone, you know, doesn't like 
the lights, uh, and they light them off at 9 p.m., not 10 p.m., or whatever. And so the people who, you know, like I drove around to around South Amherst today. Most of, the, and I think we're not just talking about restaurants, but mostly talking about restaurants. Um, almost all the restaurants in South Amherst are near like apartment buildings or people's homes. And so I just very uneasy and about having a process in place for six months and no possibility of review or their participation even after six months. And I don't want to slow the process down. I also think I don't want to get into a long thing about the language, but I think that giving members of the public an opportunity to participate and say, hey, these things are bothering me. Can we change the condition and add that? Would give the, you know, the public the input that we always give them, you know, that we want to we want our communities to have. So that's that's my comment. Thanks. Um, I'm going to call on Rob Moore. I see his hand up. Um, I just want a, a couple suggestions. I'm concerned about the amount of staff time that would be involved later down the road for potentially a number of these uh, these types of permits to be reviewed and, and just coordinating that and uh, creating the, the decisions or records of those uh, discussions. Um, but I also think it, it, it's not really necessary uh, we have our bylaw has all the findings really detailed. There's 10.38 findings to get into a lot of areas uh, which are gone through when we're reviewing these permits. And those are not just a one shot. You know, it, it's the, the operation needs to comply with our bylaw going forward. So if I'm responding to a complaint about lighting that maybe we thought or understood from the proposal met the intent of the bylaw, but it turns out it doesn't. I have an obligation to ensure that that business owner reacts to that and makes the adjustment that's needed. And that, you know, we would cite the provisions of our bylaw, which would be fully in effect all through this and afterwards. So I think those safeguards, they're there. And I think you, you can be confident that this staff is, this is what the staff does. This is not new to us. Um, even with restaurants downtown, uh, waiting lines and noise uh, to the res uh, you know heard from the residential developments nearby is not something that uh, that would be that uncommon. It's happened over the years, and we've talked at the establishments on how to manage that better. And and we have that ability, and we don't need a permit to expire or review for that to occur. Which is why in recent years, the the zoning board of appeals has stopped expiring permits. So if you look back in the 90s, early 2000s, the permits expire when the ownership changes. Uh, some of them expired after a period of time and required renewal. The zoning board in recent years has found that an effective management plan and connection to our findings in our bylaw uh, work well with good, good enforcement and, and complaint response. And, and that's what we've been trying to build is that uh, responsiveness of the business owner. And, and I think that's there's it's proven to work uh, when needed. Thank you. I'll call on Michael Burtwistle, and then I see Jack Jemsek. Yeah, um, like Janet, I am a, a, a strong proponent of as much uh, community and public participation as possible in things like this. However, I'm really convinced by Mr. Morris. Uh, a constant uh, reference to the zoning bylaw as his template for making these decisions. And as far as I'm concerned, that's convincing to me. As long as we are um, abiding by the bylaw, uh, I see no real problem with providing that, uh, providing our town officials with the authority and responsibility to comply with the existing bylaws. So uh, while I would like to have more public participation, I understand that in these conditions, uh, that is difficult at best, if not impossible. So uh, I certainly will support the bylaw as it's been proposed and trust Mr. Mora and Ms. Brestrup to uh, enforce it appropriately. Thank you. I call on Jack Jemsek. Yes. Um, I would like, you know, should we close the public hearing? We already Where are we at now? We're waiting for a motion from a planning board member. Uh, I move that we approve uh, the zoning bylaw. <laughs> Do I have a second? I see Maria, your hand went up very quickly. Second. Okay. 
Um, so as drafted, I understand. As drafted, correct. Um, so we uh, we can have further discussion. I did not know, Mandy. Do you want to take is your board ready for any kind of motion? Um, because we would normally wait until we hear a recommendation from the planning board, I would recommend that our members not make a motion until after the planning board has dealt with their motion. Okay. So just asking planning board members, are there, is there any more discussion or comment before we take a vote? I'm seeing no hands. So at this time we could do a roll call vote on this. Um, Christine, yes. I'm sorry, this is Pam. Yeah. Are we approving the bylaw or are we making a recommendation? We're making, we're taking a vote to approve our recommendation for bylaw article 14 as written. How's that? Okay. And uh, I'll call Michael Burtwistle. Uh, approve. Maria Chow? Approve. Jack Jemsek? Approve. David Levenstein? Approve. Doug Marshall? Approve. Janet McGowan? Approve. And Christine Gray Mullen? Approved. Unanimous seven. It's all yours, Mandy. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, is there any further discussion from the Community Resources Committee? I am not seeing hands, so I believe I will be looking for a motion to recommend the town council enact zoning bylaw article 14 temporary zoning as revised by attorney Bard, both as an emergency measure under charter section 210B and a regular measure under charter section 210A. I see a hand, Sarah Swartz. I so move. Sarah moves, is there a second? Second. Evan seconds. Pam, do you need to, me to send that language to you or read I, it? More? I would love for if you could send it to me. That would be wonderful. Thank you. I will you. email you that language so that you can get it exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> I know I read it pretty quickly. Um, you did. So we'll do a roll call <laughs> vote. Um, we are going to start with Evan Ross this time. Yes. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yes. Mandy Johanneke is a yes. Um, Shalini Balmil. Yes. And Sarah Swartz. Yes. That is unanimous. So can I ask uh, Mr. Mora or Christine Bestra, where does it go from here? How does the public follow this over the next week? This goes to the town council and I believe the town council is going to be reviewing this on June 15th. Is that, is that correct? So oh, yeah, the the plan is for the council to have it on their agenda for the upcoming meeting on June fifteenth for a couple of actions under Charter Section two ten a. It will be considered a first reading under Charter Section two ten uh, Charter Section two ten a is regular measures, and that section requires bylaws to be read at two separate meetings before a vote, with the vote being able to occur at the second reading of the measure. Um, so it will. Consider, be considered the first reading at that meeting, but it will also be considered under section 210B, which is emergency measures, where which the charter allows an emergency measure if the council adopts a preamble that declares it an emergency measure with reasons for declaring it an emergency measure to be able to read it and adopt it in one meeting with or without amendments and to have it apply and be um, effective immediately instead of 14 days after the vote, which is what Charter Section 210A says. So it is, the plan is to have it be sort of a dual reading in that sense this coming Monday. In a meeting, Kate. That was um, very good, Mandy. <laughs> that was a lot, but yeah. okay. Um, so that's where it will move. And okay. so what date could it be? Um, voted on and then how soon does it take effect? So if the council adopts the preamble for an emergency measure and then adopts the bylaw and votes to adopt the bylaw, um, I believe the language for that motion would have it effective on Tuesday, June 16th. 
under the emergency measure of the plan would be to bring back a second reading on June 29th if the uh, council adopts it under section 210A on June 29th, it would become effective July 13th, whatever 14 days after that date is, um, which is in this within the 60 days that an emergency measure can only be effective before it stands repealed. Um, one other thing, just for the chair of the planning board, um, because this is a formal hearing on bylaws, I believe we will need a written report. And I apologize for the quick turnaround that will be required. Um, for the council meeting on Monday. So Chris will make sure that happens. <laughs> oh no. Poor Chris. I apologize. We're trying to <laughs> that Chris. Can you say it again, Mandy? Uh, the planning board normally issues written reports on its recommendations on bylaw changes. Uh, the council would love to have that and, and should have that by its meeting on Monday the 15th. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize question. for the quick turnaround required. I have a question. Um, may I ask a question? Yes, and then after you, I'll recognize David. I see your hand hanging out there. Yes, Chris. So um, normally there's a 14-day uh, lag between the council voting for a zoning amendment and the zoning amendment becoming effective. So what I understand Mandy said was that um, because this is an emergency measure, well, if the town council agrees that it is an emergency measure and votes to adopt it as such, that there would be no 14 day waiting period. Is that my, is my understanding correct? That is correct under the charter, yes. Thank you. Great, uh, David. This may, <clears throat> excuse me, this may be uh, overly nerdy and so it, it can be disregarded, but Mandy, um, my question to you is that, as the CRC is a subcommittee of the town council, wouldn't this meeting as a, a meeting of the CRC constitute the fir a first reading of the bot proposed bylaw? Uh, not the way the council generally regards first readings. The charter is written that the council must read it as the first one. So while we are a subcommittee, it has not been a called as a meeting of the full council. And the way the council has been reading the charter is that it requires a first reading at a council meeting, not at a subcommittee meeting. Huh. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I see no other hands at this time. I'll just um, confirm with Mandy Jo that we are going to do this again next week on the 17th. We have yet another um, joint uh, public hearing between the Planning Board and the CRC for yet another proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Correct. And we might be a little smoother next week after we've gotten through we'll our get Better and better at this. Um, but thank you for coming. Um, I believe you have no other further business. If we do not have any items not anticipated by myself in advance. Um, so I am, I, for, before I declare the meeting of the Community Resources Committee adjourned, I want to thank the Planning Board for hosting us tonight. I want to thank Rob Mora, Christine Brestrup, Dave Zomek, and everyone for working on this bylaw. Um, Pam for taking notes um, and minutes. Uh, we appreciate that. And um, what, what else do I wanna say? Um, I also wanted to thank my own committee members. This is their third meeting out of five in three weeks. Um, we have two more next week and I really appreciate them taking the time to come to three Wednesday meetings in a row um, outside of the normal meeting schedule to, to make some of these happen quicker than they normally would. So I wanna thank that. And unless, uh, since I don't see any hands from my committee indicating that there is anything that I didn't anticipate that they want to talk about, I'm going to uh, declare the Community Resources Committee meeting adjourned at 8.19 p.m. Great, thank you. And thank you, CRC, we appreciate it. Um, it's great, we're sort of making history here in Amherst. We're finally living out the charter and getting some things moving, so thank you. Thank you. Jack, I see your hand. I just want to say that Mandy's background is like, I was thinking I'm in the basement and I'm like, is this still light out? And I didn't realize her background is like, you know, it's like C, you know, CGI quality there. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm glad you're impressed, Jack. <laughs> you know, Mandy, if you can send that background to Jack, I think you might appreciate it. Okay. It's, it's a picture that town staff took of the town room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to move ahead um, to item five, old business, and item, uh, I'm sorry, item four, old business, and item five, new business. Both, uh, Chris, do we have anything on either of those? No, and we'll be back again next week together so we can consider anything then. Okay, great. So can I also then consider nothing under um, item seven and eight? Nothing. That's ZBA applications and the SPP, SPR sub applications. Okay, we'll go. So then I'm just going to go to item nine, which is planning board committee and liaison reports. I'll just call it out there. Does anyone um, have any report? Just raise your hand um, and I'll call on you. Any of the five or like Chris said, we're meeting next week. If I can wait a week. Uh, oh, do you, I see Jack's hand. Uh, there might be a meeting tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a Zoom meeting. I haven't got an announcement, but um, I, I we may have a meeting tomorrow. Is all. Just wanted to say that. Did you did you see that as well, Christine? I saw that there was one, but they were having a problem getting. It's not a quorum, but they have some minimum they have to meet. Maybe eleven towns or something like that, and they hadn't got it. So ah. she had sent out a shout out yesterday. Yeah. So and no. I'm boring everyone, but I did forward that to you and. Yeah, we, I can follow up after with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I don't see any other hands for that. So um, report of chair, I have nothing. Just thank you. This was also an extra meeting for the planning board tonight. So um, thank you all for your dedication and the hard work. And I just, a shout out to staff. I know how hard and how crazy life is for you all right now. And thank you for giving your extra time because I know you're doing way over your normal hours. But um, I hope the businesses realize that there are a lot of people who are really putting a lot of brain power and effort to try to help you all out there. So um, thank you all. Uh, report of staff. I want to thank you all too for paying attention to this and looking at it in such great detail and having a really good discussion and I appreciate the fact that you have approved it. So we're going to move ahead with this. Thank you very much. We'll move ahead with bringing it to town council and then and then we'll move ahead with it. <laughs> and then you'll have lots more work, Chris. So. Have lots more work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so at this point we'll adjourn. Do I hear a motion to end, second, anyone? Shout out. And thank you, Amherst Media, as always. Thank you, Doug, I see. Yep. Adjourn at 822. Sounds good.